Your finance is not an obligation. I want us always to remember that everything is according to the word of God. It is a blessing. It's how we're going to walk in the blessings of God. Every time that we give, that's because since, since you're a giving ministry, we're able to, to step on distant shores. And, in, and Tanzania is already preparing for us to come back next year. And they want to do a large crusade in one of their cities, probably about 10,000 people into those crusades. They want to get us back. And they want to get those pastors in off the field. Some of those 85 pastors, and by then he could have 100 churches. He's constantly expanding. And then pull these pastors in off the field so we could invest into them. Everything we do is without investing into the men of God, the pastors, that any crusades that we do are going to fall by the side of the road. We must have the ministries strengthened and equipped. So as we do the crusades, then we have places and churches to put the people so they are disciples for the things of God. I want to talk about the, the power of your giving and the strength of your giving before we take the offering. Because every time, whenever we're done, after they take the offering, if you know, this is what we do every time. I take the offering and we bless it and we pray for you. And we pray for that offering. Because, because this is not about trying to pull money out of your pocket and, you know, and find you know, some kind of a get-rich-quick scheme. This is about your giving, your sowing, and we want God to bless it back to you Pressed down, shaking together, and running over. But for that to happen, you got to know the principle as to why you're doing it. Why you have the right that when you that when you that when you bring your offering every week, why you have the right to stand in a principle of faith and say, God, I'm trusting you. And this is why, because I'm being obedient to a platform of your provision. I'm standing in a promise, and I have the right to hold that promise. So hell cannot take back what you have given me. I'm holding something against the kingdom of darkness. Now I want you to look in your Bible first. I want you to go to Luke's gospel. And if you want to just circle these things, write these down because every, every time you give you want to be able to stand on the devil's neck. Okay? Every time you give you want to stand on the devil's neck and you want to keep him in check because if the devil could steal anything he would steal all your provision off of you. We, Take a look at the poverty that we saw here. There's a lot of poverty there, and they live from hand to mouth. And by the way, I did not eat the face of that fish. <laughs> there was, they, they like to eat the head and the eyeballs and the whole thing, and there's fins on the thing, and, and, the, and the pasta slapped that big old fish on my plate, and Adam used, I've got nausea to get out of it, and I didn't have nausea. So I had to dig into that thing and try to eat on that fish. Oh, no, thank you, Jesus. Oh, and they loved to cook their chickens, and their chickens were tough, and they were, they were not American chickens. It got to the point of we just were eating rice at the end. No, 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 please, no, no, please, no more of that, that bird, because that's what they've got. They raise them, rice, kill and eat. Well, no, you killed, I ain't eating it. And these, this is this. They raise them, and then they, you know, I mean, then they're gonna put them in a pot. That you're gonna eat it, and they, I don't. It just doesn't make sense. We got back to the airport, and there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken there. <laughs> we beat feet to get real chicken and sat there and ate it. It was exciting. But this is what they, this is what they do. They don't have a lot, but what it is, they don't walk in the spirit of poverty. The fact they didn't use their poverty as an excuse not to take a small offering for the man of God. That's why it was so honorable. Because they live from hand to mouth every day. So, so for them, sowing and reaping and the principles of giving have tremendous power for them. To get them to know the little bit and to know the promise of what will bring them out of poverty themselves. Get a generation to be raised up knowing that in whatever discipline, when you begin to stay, stand somewhere, you begin to walk, there's a, there's a promise from God that God can bust through poverty. Poverty is straight from the pit of hell. Satan rules in poverty. So in order to break poverty, it's not just throwing something at it. You've got to have something supernatural, a promise from God, so you can attack the spirit of poverty and overthrow it. Something has to have been bought and paid for, and that is through Christ Jesus, kingdom power to confront the spirit of poverty. 
and bring the provision. It's not about flowing in great wealth and riches. It's about breaking a spirit and finding that God will supply all of your needs. So as you release, you always trust in God. There's always a source coming back to you because you have set another principle in motion. You've set a principle in motion that has the power to overthrow everything that the devil is trying to do. I had you go in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and look at verse 5. The devil makes a declaration about who owns the world's economy. See, we got God's economy, but we need to access God's economy. Just like accessing any provision, salvation, you got to make a decision. You want to walk in the promises of God, you got to make a decision. I'm going to stand there so that promise can be enacted in my life against the devil's kingdom. And notice he says, and the the devil takes him up into a high mountain, verse 5, showed him all the kingdoms and all the wealth of the world, and he said, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. That wasn't delivered, he stole it. And I will give it to whomever I wish. If you'll just worship me, if you'll just worship his system, and you just trust him, he says, I'll give you whatever you want. Now, we all know he's a liar and a thief, but he owns it nonetheless. And he's looking for those that will worship his system and his way of doing it, getting into the natural man and trying to fight it in the natural ways and seeing God's provision in the natural thing. Then God's not involved because now you're messing in the devil's kingdom. That's why getting us out of trusting the world for your source and getting into a principle that God is going to become the authority of my source is what our giving is all about. And notice Jesus rejected the whole thing because he had a better principle. He had a powerful principle. In Ephesians chapter 2, turn there in your Bible. So the devil thinks he owns the economies of the world. Fine, but now we have another kingdom. So that's his kingdom's rule. See, the goal is to overthrow his kingdom's rule. So you're not walking in fear every time you, every time you give, every time you tithe. There, there, there's so much fear out there right now that we're so afraid, and I understand that. But we got to break that power. We have, to, we have to release a promise so God can invade and invest his kingdom. But everything is a promise that God gives you that you must act on. Somebody say faith. Faith, faith is acting on something, standing on something. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? And faith without action has no power. I've got to be standing in something. I've got to be applying something so that I've activated my faith so God can operate in his promise. Does that make sense? In chapter 2 of Ephesians, the Bible says, And you he has made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, according to the prince of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. So he declares not only does Satan have authority over the economy of the world, but he's also walking as the prince of the power of the air, controlling how men operate in the economy of the world because he's in control. Ephesians chapter 6, if you turn there, I'm just throwing a whole bunch of word at you because we need to have this. Therefore, we got to recognize that we're up against principalities and powers. Do we understand that? We saw a lot of demonic activity. I mean, there's a lot of demonic activity over there. And it turns out because there's a vast... There's a vast amount of witchcraft which is taking place. So there's principalities and powers that are being powerfully strengthened by those that are deliberately conjuring demonic powers and releasing them against God's people. And this is, a, this is an all-out assault. There are serious principalities and powers that must be addressed and taken down. And many of these poor people are just in the survival mode trying to get a breakthrough, but they got to be elevated to know how to address the higher level of the kingdom of darkness. That's why the Bible says here, put on the whole armor of God and take up the promises of God. So I got to put on the whole armor of God so I know how to stand in the armor of God. But but, but unless I take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God, then I don't have the offensive weaponry in which to fight, confront, and defeat the devil's kingdom. Now go to Matthew's gospel chapter 6. Jesus, after the devil had tried to get him to buy into his economy, remember that's what he tried to do, 
He tried to get Jesus to buy in and come under his authority. Now, we know we got to work and we got to eat, but we need to have a principle greater than the natural realm that always maintains a supernatural covering over our life so I can trust, even, you know, I was working at a warehouse. I'd only been working for so long. I was working third shift or something like that, and my wife was great with child. And, and we were getting ready to have this baby, but, but, but we were already givers, okay? And I got this, and suddenly we have this meeting. We have a meeting upstairs in the big break room, and they're telling us, now my wife is due. She's going to have this baby at the end of the, at the, end of the month, and they bring us all up there, and I'm being a newbie on the dock, and they say, we're about to have a great layoff. And I knew as a fact that when I went down them stairs, my wife is due with the baby. We're just getting into the insurance, which means it's not going to last, and I'm about to be laid off, okay? And then, of course, I got the notice, I'm laid off now, and I went home, and what did I do? I came back where we're living with your mother at that time, God have mercy, but we're living at the mother at that time, and I came and sat down the come to bed to tell my wife that I've been laid off. And what was I doing? I was laughing. I was laughing. Because I knew already that God had us. I was, she said, what are you laughing about? I had so much joy knowing that God would provide. In fact, God even told me that we were to put the deposit down because, of, because our tax return was coming. Go ahead and put it on the, on the little apartment that you want because I'm going to meet you at that moment. Even though I waited a week because of my lack of great faith, I still did it, and the money, everything came exactly when I needed. All the provision came, finance came, and I ended up back in my job. I obeyed God. We were in a place of obedience that even when there suddenly seemed to be a loss that came against us, instead of being defeated in my spirit, I tell you what, I had a Holy Ghost joy came on me. I sat down in that bed. I was laughing. I was laughing. God was all over because he said, I have got you. She wasn't. No, she wasn't. She was not. She was slightly aggravated at me, but I couldn't help myself. I had joy because I knew where I stood. I knew where we stood. And that was how I put God to the test in a sense without, without putting him to a temptation. But I had the joy going, you know what? I got something the devil does not have. He cannot because I have set something, a principle in motion that cannot be defeated. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and look at this. Jesus overthrows Satan's attempt at trying to own him under his economy. And he says, uh-uh, uh God knows all of your needs. And we've seen great need. So I'm not coming from the big abundance. I'm coming from, we've been in the third world, and we're going to go back. Other places want us desperately. So we're just trusting God line upon line to provide the supply so we can invest into them. I told these men this on this Friday, they are watchmen on the walls. Guard the doctrine, guard the nation, guard the generation. I mean, obviously it turned out very well. We're just very blessed. It's hard because you lose so much in the translation. And it's difficult doing a Zoom. But, but, but God is faithful. And, the, and they come out strengthened when they go back. And they face all the, all the foul spirits, the doctrinal failures, and all the things that try to destroy the blessing of God's people because they got to turn their nations around. Jesus overthrew the devil's attitude when he says that. God knows you got all these needs, but here's what you're going to do. You're not going to trust the devil's economy. You're going to trust God. And he said, you are going to make this decision. You seek first the kingdom and its righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you. So he puts a demand. He says, you chase the kingdom of God. You chase the principles of God. You chase the promises of God. And you chase that you be in right standing with God. And you are in a position where every need can, shall, and will be met. Because you'll be standing in a place of obedience. Give him a shout of praise. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. I got a lot of scripture, but you know, this is all good. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Jesus says, as he's telling Peter about how Peter's great revelation that he was the Christ, and I use this a lot, but let's use every scripture as it's allowed to be used. 
I just gave you something. These are loud. The devil has his economy. We need to get God's economy into the middle of it. And, if we, and the only way to get God's economy in is to step into God's principle. God's principle brings God's economy. That's why we have the right to trust God even in the lack that God's going to bring more than enough because that's the test. I won't stand my ground. And here he says, and he says in verse 18, now I Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. That's on the revelation of who Jesus is. Now he is not only the, he is the Messiah, but he's also the fulfiller of every covenant promise. That God gave. And he says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not overthrow it. Therefore, he says, in order to do that, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you the keys to access the kingdom of God. Everything is a principle and a faith principle. Always, always connected to an action of something you're just, it's not good works, it's believing what God said and stepping into what God said and developing a discipline in what God said. When I do these things, I have the right to expect that what God said is going to come through because every time I stand my ground in faith, I'm overthrowing the devil's kingdom and I'm constantly establishing God's kingdom and his principle. He says, I want to give you the keys of the kingdom. So whatever you need to bind, you can bind. Whatever you need to loose, you can loose. I'm going to give you the principles. I'm going to give you the right to access. Remember, we're working. We're walking in the devil's kingdom. We need to access God's kingdom. But in order to bring the supernatural into the natural, we need to know the provisions and the words and the promises. And then once we know them, we have the responsibility to use them. Okay, you get a 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Second Peter, I love the Bible. You know, we, we learn to walk on it, just like we had to walk on that bridge. Of course, Adam made sure that I went first. And it wasn't out of respect for his elders, I don't think. We had a great time. We really did. Thank you for allowing us to go. Thank you for allowing us to go. And yes, he almost got dragged out of that car. I was going to get out of my door and try to run around and save him. And I thought, what the heck, that's stupid. It'd be like a mosh pit, damp, throwing our bodies around. Well, that would have been dumb to get out. You know, but I was getting, I go, wait a minute now. And then the Moses reached over and grabbed him and yanked him back in. They slammed the door. It was like, my gosh, we would have lost the media director. There, there he goes. There he goes. There he, goes. <laughs> he would disappear all the time. They'd go take pictures. And I'd be like, where the heck did he go now? And Moses would be looking with me like, you know what? His job is to keep an eye on him. And there's Adam. I don't know if his camera's still working. But we got great pictures. Thank you for being so risky in your life as we went and did everything we did. Second Peter chapter 1, and look at verse 2, 3, and 4, and look at these. When we look at these scriptures, we make a decision. I want to build the whole principle that says, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Notice the grace is the provision of everything we need from God. Grace is the ongoing flow of God. And notice he says, grace and peace be multiplied in the knowledge. In the knowledge. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is everything. Knowing is everything. Because you can act on what you know. You cannot act on what you don't know. And what you don't know can destroy your life. We all know that. So what we know can give us the wisdom and the discernment to act on genuine principles. So he says, as his divine power, that is his resurrected, ascended victory, what he has done has given to us everything that pertains to what? Life and godliness. Provide for you in the natural and provide for you in the supernatural. Both of these coming out of the supernatural. As he can provide everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own virtue, by himself, by his own work, by his own grace, by his own power, by which you have been given exceeding, somebody say exceeding, great and precious what? Promises. That through these we can partake of what the divine nature has given us. Jesus becomes our provision. He becomes our provider. He becomes our source. The ever-present one. The God that can move the mountain. The God that can walk on the water. He becomes the one that can make sure that no matter what comes against you, he's got a promise and a provision to bring you through all of it. So that by these great promises we can escape everything that the world tries to destroy you with. Okay? 
Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians. And notice, the Bible is just, it's just, a, it's just a good book. It's not a bunch of don'ts, it's a bunch of do's. So the Bible is a bunch of do's. And look at verse 20. Paul wanted to go, he wants to get back in there, but there's some delay. But he has, but he's standing on his yeses and truths where he's standing. But he does say, even though he may be hindered, God's word is not. I may be hindered, and things may make it difficult for me to get to you, but God's word is not hindered when you're standing in the promise. Because that's the supernatural, ordering the natural. That's God and his kingdom invading the kingdoms of darkness. And even when the devil goes in and tries to disrupt God's right there to bring the breakthrough as is needed. Somebody say amen. And he says in verse 20, for all the promises of God in Christ are yes. Somebody say promise. And, and yes and in him and the amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Now the amen has to be spoken by you. Act it on. When I say God's promise is, is this, I have to stand up and say, yes, amen, so be it, and I receive it to myself, and I begin to... See, that's what matures us. That's what makes us real, genuine disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, because we start acting on his word in every attitude of our life. We're not just pew observers. Now we become believers that are participating in the kingdom, and now you become actively operating, and you begin to represent the fullness Everything God did, he had a release against Satan's kingdom. He had to give a promise that when you stand on, he has every legal right to punch through whatever the devil tries to do. Poverty is from the pit of hell. The spirit of lack is that demonic attack that, that makes you feel that you have nothing. And when you get the spirit of lack in poverty, then you have hopelessness. But even when you have lack, if you break the spirit of lack, that I'm just, that I don't have and it'll never happen and feel sorry for yourself, that's the spirit of lack. And everybody owes me and it'll never work. That's the spirit. You go overseas, you find people that have lack, but they don't have the spirit of lack. They'll give you whatever they got. And we're screaming about all the stuff we do have. They were afraid to give away anything because they might have nothing. And here they have nothing but what they do have. They'll give it to you. Why? Because they don't have the spirit. They just have the poverty. So, we, so now that their spirit is ready to receive the word to break the poverty. Poverty is not of God. It is of the fallen, broken nature of man. And it's connected to the devil's kingdom. That's why we just don't sow money over there. We, we decided, we made the commitment, and then this week we set finance because, there, because we were standing in that building by faith because they had the other building that was, which was the old smaller building. But by faith we stood in the bigger building and claimed it even though they had no walls on it. And we thought because you're standing in faith, we're going to invest into your faith. Now you can't send tons and tons of money, but a couple hundred dollars here is a lot of money overseas. So start to invest, and they have to operate. You stand there, you buy the bricks, now you're following through. We invested into their faith. God made us a provision for their faith. Okay? They may not have it to themselves, but he used us as a ministry to provide. See, it may come from the north, east, south, and west, but when you're, if they weren't standing in faith, I would not have made a commitment. But because they were standing in faith, it was easy to say, huh, a nudge of the Holy Spirit. Invest into this place. Why, that's God answering their prayer. So it came from us into them. God supplied their need because they were already investing. Malachi chapter 3. Okay? The Bible talks about robbing God and, and stealing from Him and we, sometimes we capitalize on the negative of this. But the problem was, when you're taking back what belongs to God, that was God's principle that I can keep blessing the nation. See, God was there, and I will bless this nation. I'll provide for the nation of Israel. I will pour in the nation. But here's what I need you to do so I can continue. There must be a sowing in order to be a reaping. You must make sure there's provision in the house so the word is never limited. And when you stand in that provision, then you give me the right to break through what the devil would try to do and keep providing and bless you exceedingly and abundantly. So he gave them a promise and a provision. Vision. That if they stood in it, hell has to, remember, the devil says it's all mine, I'll give it to you, and God says, no, 
I will give it to you out of my kingdom. Don't trust his kingdom. Don't go to his table for communion. You stay at my table for communion. You drink of my word. You drink of what I've done. And I am the Lord that will bless you. You stay at my table. You don't need the table of idols. And you don't need the table of the world. You need God's table. And from that place is the blessing. And he says this. Verse 10. Trust me, he's saying. And now remember, he's talking in Malachi here to captives that have just come back. This is a small nation now of people. They got enemies that are surrounding them. They were allowed to come back from captivity. And they're just finishing up a temple. And and they got the walls around the city, but that's all that they are. They're still under the dominion and the rule of of, of the Medo-Persian Empire. They're not the great nation. They're just who they are. They have enemies all around. And here God is strengthening them by the prophet saying, look, do this. And watch what I will do in the midst of all of your enemies. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Try me, please, and test me. This is one of the greatest promises of provision in the word of God. And if God gave it here and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's a covenant promise that Jesus now takes and uses it. And he says, seek first the kingdom, the government, the promises of God, and and, and the righteousness of God, and all these things shall be added to you. I will break the devil's kingdom by using mine. And here's the promise God gave to them. He says, and see if I do not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. He's telling the nation, the window over you has a latch on it. And when you stand in obedience, all that I have for you, that's all I need is you to do what little I ask here. Make me the source of everything you have. Make me the one that blesses you. Give me that small part that makes me the owner and not the devil and his kingdom the owner. When you can't release the God, just say, I'm trusting myself, which means you're trusting the devil's kingdom and God can't bless you because his blessing is connected to his kingdom and your obedience in his kingdom. So he says, that window's just hanging over your head like a giant latch. And when you throw into God's kingdom and say, this is my blessing, and that means you, you're saying my economy, and I'm the owner, you're hitting that thing. And the widow flies open and the kingdom of God can begin to pour. He says, as a nation, I will bless you. And to bless a nation, he has to bless individuals. See, a nation is made up of people. There's no reason to have a government unless you have people. You make up the nation. So the nation can only be blessed when you're blessed. So he tells the nation, you trust me as individuals. And I'll pour out the blessing not only on you, but I'll bless the whole nation. And notice what he says. And see if I don't open the windows of heaven. Pour out a blessing. Verse 11. Here's the biggie. Somebody said the biggie. Because the devil's kingdom is always trying to take you out and take your provision out. The devil's a thief. He says, and then I can rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Hallelujah. So he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Notice, this is their provision. This is their finance. This is how they lived. They don't have dollars and dimes. People say, well, that was the Old Testament, and they didn't give him money. They didn't have money. What they possessed was wheat. What they possessed was chickens. What they possessed was, people have goats over there. Oh, look at all the pretty goats. Yeah, that's dinner. Everybody had a goat or two or three. And that was going to be a future meal. Because they didn't have dollars and dimes. That's why we didn't really want offerings. We were coming home with a bunch of chickens. Live chickens. That's the man of God. What am I going to do with a bunch of cluckers? You know? Arise, pastor. Kill and eat. Yeah, eggs. We, had, we, we did eat lots of eggs. Hard boiled. That was one thing we knew we could trust. The eggs and the rice, they cooked cooked everything in the same bowls outside over charcoal or over wood. Everything was cooked outside. It was just cooked in a big old thing, and then it went from there to plate, kind of. It's like, okay. That's what they possessed, and God needed to bless them. And he says here, I will bless you. I'm going to bless your ground, your fields, everything about you, says the Lord. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delight, because I am the God that blesses you. You. Let's go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. I'm going to wind it down here. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. 
Hallelujah. Look at verse 37 and 38. Because, you know, the more we have, here's the promises of God. You build doctrine by knowing the promises of God. And when you establish doctrine, then you have the right to stand, not just on one little word. The word is good, but build the doctrine. So when you're standing in the doctrine of it, then you know emphatically why you believe what you believe, and you've got a ton of scriptures to back you up as you stand in the doctrine of it. Just because someone says you need to give your money. I mean, people do it all the time, and I'm sorry that they do that. You give this one time in the service, give a zillion dollars, and God will bless you back a hundredfold. He can't do it because you have no discipline of giving in the first place. And just because the man of God or some, someone calls themselves that just suddenly makes this comment, that's not true either. You need to know in your heart that God is asking you to invest something because you're already a giver, and you're building on something you already do. So this is above and beyond. You've already established the principle. You're walking in discipline. So then when that, so when that word comes to give on something, it's not because you're doing God a favor. It's because God's all, all offering you a blessing because you're already walking in obedience. So if you do this, you know it because you're already doing it. Does that make sense to somebody? People get manipulated all the time. Supposed to just give a zillion dollars and they don't give it all. All of a sudden that's going to bless them. You've been, you've been hogwashed. There was a principle of doctrine. I'm a pastor. Because this is a weekly thing we do. A constant thing. A daily thing you operate in. And the word has got to work for all of us. Somebody say yes. Yes. Won't you bless. But it's got to be you and God walking in this. So when someone makes the word. You got to know it's from the Holy Spirit. And you already are standing in the principle. He says, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Notice he puts that as a precursor. You got to walk in forgiveness first. Let me say forgiveness. And that's not just for the other guy. That's for you. Okay? You have to walk in forgiveness. You have to let it go. Let God walk away from it. Trust the Holy Spirit. And walk in a place of peace between you and God. Because God can't bless your unforgiveness. He blesses your forgiveness. And then he says, and then given it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it shall be measured back to you. Say, God is my provider. God is my blessing. God is my abundance. God is my source. Proverbs chapter 11. So notice he says here, forgive you shall be forgiven. Given it shall be. So it is a principle. I'm not going to forgive once. I got to forgive constantly. Why? To free myself to receive from God. There are disciplines that we have to walk in as believers. We have to be accountable for all of our actions. Not hide a bunch under the bed or turn under the rug, but you can't hide them under the rug because they're too many. It's a gigantic lump. lump, Someone's going to trip over it and break their neck. So you've got to shove it all under the bed where everything else goes. No, it's got to be dealt with. Go to Proverbs. Can you find Proverbs in your Bible? Find Proverbs chapter 11. Notice he says, given it shall be given. Just keep turning left till you find Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11. At times, when we want to yell, no, 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 we're going to run from everything, but we want to see God bless and provide. I put it in here somewhere in my Bible. Proverbs chapter 11, here it is. Notice it says in verse 25. These are all to encourage you. Nothing I'm giving is to condemn you or shame you. It's to feed you the word of God So you can stand and make the decision how you're going to stand in the word. It's got to be built into your spirit. So you can walk out going, I've got the word on it. I've got scripture upon scripture upon scripture on it. Not just one thing, but scripture upon scripture and principle upon principle. Not just give, 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 but principles of kingdom that will affect every other area of your life. All the kingdom principles, you got, you got to get them all and you want it all. So in order to line up with this, I got to line up with this. That's called make disciples of all nations. Making followers of Christ who stand in his kingdom, exercise his kingdom and walk in the, and walk in the principles of his kingdom. It says here, the generous soul, the generous soul will be made rich. The Bible, and what it means is also, is that it's to be enlarged, even fattened in some not in a bunch of household of fat people, but that's not the point. But it's just the fact of you being enriched and just being equipped in the things of God. 
Notice it says, shall be equipped. And he who waters will also be watered himself. Given it shall be given. Notice he puts a blessing on it. God will provide abundantly. One who waters will also be watered. People will curse the one who is a stingy person, but will bless the one who is not. It's not about giving everything away in the store. It's about walking with an attitude of, I'm not going to look back at what I just did. I'm going to look forward at what I just did. Can I go to Luke, and I'll go to Luke chapter 11. I'm not going to look back. I'm going to look forward. When I release, I'm going to release. I'm going to say release. Because I built a provision into this whole thing. Look at, look at Luke's gospel chapter 11 and verse 5 on. Chapter 11 verse 5. Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves because you have a need. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. Now, we don't think of that in, in American terms, but overseas they had to make their own bread. And they were always cooking, always cooking, and always eating. Because they were always cooking, so we were always eating. The same thing, but always eating. Rice and chicken. Pastors couldn't wait to drag you to the side so we could eat rice and chicken. And his friend had a, and his friend came and he said, and, and he will answer from within and say, don't trouble me, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give, because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. Now think about, apply that to your principle. You're already a giver. You've developed the principle of giving. So when you have a need, you have the right to stand on the principle that you're already a giver. I'm a tither. I'm a tither. I'm a tither. I'm a tither. Now, Pastor, what's the difference between tithing and just giving? Okay, can I give you this? There are three places you can you stand in in your life. One is when we're afraid to give it all, but but, but we know the word, and, but it's difficult to give it all. And we're to stay in a loop of fear. Somebody say fear. fear. We stay in a loop. That's like anything else. Until you break out of this circle. And I don't mean come charging out like the, you know, just like the steeds out the door. But you're, you're stuck in a spot where you can't because you're afraid and this and this and that. Then there's the next level where you, where you take a risk and you give. And you give something. Okay. That's just beginning of an act of obedience. So yeah, I gave. Doesn't mean the windows of heaven are going to tear, tear, tear through, but you're breaking a demonic hold here and you're stepping out because you're start stepping toward the kingdom of God. So you give a little something. And then several weeks later, you try it again. And you try it again. Now the conviction says, get to the point of a discipline to where you're giving all the time. On the discipline of giving, you have the right to expect to receive. Okay? Now I'm giving. I'm developing something. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, it talks about the sower sowing seed. You got to get good ground. You got to sow it according to the measure of God. You got to stand it and you got to trust. Here you are constantly releasing the seed. Now, if you, don't, if you ain't giving it, if you ain't giving it, you have no right to receive, no right to ask on it. But when you give it sporadically, there still isn't any real payback because you haven't developed the discipline. So now you want to develop it. The discipline, and once you develop the discipline in your giving, now you have the right to expect a blessing coming on your seed. Okay? Are you with me? There's a blessing because now you're consistently sowing, you have the right to expect a harvest. But you know where the promise comes, and this is where we're all getting, this is what we're all doing. We're moving toward the tithe. Why? Because the tithe is where the promise is. The tithe is the promise. Yeah, but why? Because God said something. He said a, He said something in the heavens. And he declared, at this level of your giving, when you start giving, there's a blessing. But you got to maintain the discipline in the giving. I'm telling us all this because we're constantly moving forward, right? Constantly moving forward. We're constantly moving forward. The breakthrough is coming when I can move from one level and then move to the point of saying, now I got a blessing. But what I really need is I need to get to the promise. And it may take you a bit to, work, to walk it up because why? Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing by the word of God. 
when we rise all the way to the top, we make a decision that come to the place to not want to become the tither God's called me to be because I've trusted him all the way through his word. I know he's a blesser. I know his word is, but I want to get to the place of Malachi where now my giving is connected to the promise. I want to get myself to this place where I've now developed a discipline and I'm now trusting God completely and not man's economy. God is my source. Stand your feet in the house, would you please? Us just come forward. Now, I did this. I'm not asking for anything else, but I'm asking you, when you, as you give, because we, we do this every week, and, I, and you know me, I, I, I don't get up here and ever beg for money. I've never, I don't do this. But it's a principle that must be taught. So when you're holding your offering, I always have people hold their offering up, okay? Hold their offering up. Because I want you to think, what did I learn? Hold your offering up before God, before God. We're breaking that spirit off of your life. Poverty, you're done. Spirit of lack, you're done. Spirit of fear, you're done. You're done, you're done, you're done. Today I begin to make a decision that I'm going to take back. Because I'm going to transfer my trust from the world and myself to you. It is your word, line upon line, principle upon principle, bit by bit. So we hold that offering up and saying, God, now see my heart. I want to have a heart of excitement. So when we come in to give, what are we doing? We're constantly making a declaration, and we're standing our ground, drawing that line in the sand where the devil cannot cross over. That's when we commit and we give. We have the right attitude every time you commit and you release it because I'm standing in a promise I'm standing in obedience. I'm thanking God. Hallelujah, devil, once again. You stay defeated over my life.